All right, it's Thursday, and that means we've got another live stream here with us today for the second installment uh, of his series. Uh, Fill Your Meat Locker is Nick Groves. Nick, how's it going? <laughs> hey, guys. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good round here. Getting amped for, uh, for Tried Season. I think we're 37 days away now. So, yeah. Yeah, very excited. I'm sure you are as well. Uh, yeah, we're getting close. So you're actually counting the days, minutes, and hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right on. Uh, right on. So I guess we're back. We're going to just really just loop off or take off from where we ended last time because we ran a little late because we were probably both talking a little too much. So um, I think tonight, why don't we just start tying and start talking about the fly and uh, and and start going through it? Yeah, absolutely. So for anyone who wasn't watching last time, just a quick little intro to Nick. Nick, you're a Renzetti tying ambassador, guide on the Grand River, been fishing since, uh, well, probably before I was born, and a hell of a, an angler in your own right. Uh, you've become quite well known for your streamer tying in particular, although I know you tie some great tiny stuff too. Um, yeah, this is this is a real treat to be able to have you here, and uh, you know, some of the biggest names out there when it comes to streamers particularly, so you've got a lot of great insight to offer. Um, as we go through this, so you're going to tie a fly tonight. Oh, I uh, should also mention, I think we talked about this last time, this fly still is nameless, right? Uh, we don't have a name for this one. No, it is a heavily inspired uh, Russ Madden uh, streamer. Um, so it is. it does remain nameless. And if we wanted to um, come up with a name, let's go for it. <laughs> there you go. So we're going to maybe have a little naming contest, depending on if people have any good ideas. Um, if you have something that you think would fit this fly, drop it in the chat, and uh, maybe this fly won't be so nameless at the end of this. Um, yeah. Yeah. And as we go, um, you know, Nick is a, a wealth of information, and uh, we're going to talk our way through this one. But, um, you know, if you have questions along the way, again, just drop them in the chat, and we'll, uh, we'll answer those as we go. All right. So right on. Yeah, I think um, I think we went through my entire life story last time, Chris. So, <laughs> you know, for for those that don't know me, that was the brief introduction. And uh, and uh, yeah, stream retire, love fish and streamers, love all different uh, fish and streamers for all different types of trout uh, or all different types of fish. And um, yeah, we went over a lot of the way I fish, what I use, how I fish, how I approach fishing, um, all that kind of stuff, and talked a lot about you know being confident and putting time in on the river is is two of the main things, um, and loving it too. I guess we we didn't really talk too much about just how much we love this sport, and that's got to be the reason why we do it, right? Having fun with our friends, uh, learning new things, and you know, it, there's so many different elements that just are make fly fishing such a benefit in general um sanity checks is a huge one for me right now with uh, all the stuff that i have going on uh, house moves building new houses moving to rentals and uh, yeah, just lots of stuff lots of work going on so this is fun uh time flies it's got to be fun and um fishing's fun too so um, this this fly is what, what we were hoping to get through last time. Um, it's kind of an improv or a freestyle sort of deal. Um, it's a very approachable streamer from you know looking at the materials and uh, the techniques. Um, there's not really much new here, uh, but it is kind of cool because it is you know I'm trying to build this fly geared around uh, like our tailwater or credit river uh, a streamer. So I'm not I'm not doing this thing blowing it out of the park at like a seven inch fly. I wanted to get it down and scale it down to a size that's going to be very approachable to cast fish and and also matching you know some of the stuff in our rivers. So trusty ruler is always out and I, I try and even though this one's got four shanks uh, built into it it's sort of like a half game changer platform uh, it's still like tip to tail is coming out of four and a half inches um which is kind of neat um the other thing is too is that we're in the in the front here you you can use lead eyes on this but i wanted this to be sort of a burn and fly so i i, I wanted it to kind of uh swim in the mid column or be able to fish shallower water so i've got a bead chain uh, four bead chains on there. Um, just gives you a bit of a different swim, uh, you know, covering different water columns. You're not going to be able to drop this thing in behind a boulder and jig it through a bucket. Um, but certainly it's it's a pretty good searching pattern. And uh, anything that Russ invents and creates and anything that's kind of follows that mindset, it's got to be a good good fly. 
Um, so again, pretty standard materials here and techniques. And uh, but it is kind of cool because we're getting into that whole like game changer platform and profile that's gonna that's gonna put a pretty fun swim on this guy. And again, nice and easy. You could cast this fly on a probably a four weight, a fast four weight. You could probably get away with this. There's not a lot to it. Uh, but the goal again is to create a profile in a bulk without having to bog it down. So few synthetics, few few natural materials on this. Uh, and again, nothing out of the ordinary. So I think the best way to to get going at this is just to start. So the back is going to be a 15 uh, mil shank. And I just do that to help prevent fouling. This is a double hook fly if we are fishing water that is uh, that is into where you're allowed. Um, there's lots of trout fisheries where this is allowed. I would say that if you are able to fish a double hook, and again, we always talk about this, um, at least pinch the barbs down. I don't ever fish a double hook fly or any fly for that matter with, with barbs. Most of the hooks I do tie are on barbs. Um, but hey, if you can find a barbless hook that that you like tying this kind of stuff on, go for it. Um, again, if in with something like this, you know, at the four and a half inch range, um, I would be probably tempted if I had to cut a hook off. Probably I would cut the back hook off because uh, it is a very approachable size of fly to a larger fish. Uh, and generally, they're going to attack it from the head or they're going to T-bone this thing. So you're not going to get those subtle kind of steel head takes on the swing on this. You're probably going to get hammered. So I would tend to leave that back hook off or replace it with a shank. But I would probably put two hooks on because if you're tying this fly, you want to be able to fish it wherever you can. Um, so and I'm going to throw. Yep. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. For somebody fishing no uh, locally, I mean, that thing just has bass written all over it to me, too. So. You know, oh yeah like series, you can fish two hooks if you want to so yeah no no harm in doing that um yeah before we get too into it one comment i know we had uh last time was um i mean even though it took us i could call it almost two hours i think to tie that fly because we were talking so much um if we can kind of slow down some of the the steps themselves and just kind of yep. dig into the, the steps i think some folks probably appreciate that uh, for sure. Yeah, no, let's, uh, that's why we're tying here. So we're not going to learn all about me again. And we'll, we'll slow it down and walk through kind of the process. So um, this again, I'll just, uh, we're starting with a shank. Uh, you could use, there's two kind of different ones. One of them seems a little beefier in the gauge. They're both kind of the same thing. I, I like the articulated fish spines uh, for any size right up into smaller musky flies, just because they're, they're nice to work on. Uh, and they're not super bulky. Um, so 15 mil on the back, tie it on. And usually I just, I'll, I'll tie on my thread and then lash down that back to close it, to close the loop on the back end. Um, and I'm using a, a Vivas thread tonight. Uh, again, Vivas 140 power thread is my uh, my streamer. Any kind of fly, unless I'm getting into something that needs GSP, where I would where I would be either spinning hair or possibly doing a, a loop, a dubbing loop or something that I really want to cinch things into. Uh, the Vivas power thread, the 140 is great. Um, perfect amount of stretch, perfect amount of strength. You can really tighten things down by stretching the thread rather than really just cranking it with like a non-stretch GSP or, or something like that. So I will even tie a lot of my nips on this anymore, especially for steelhead, because I can get them, you know, it's not a bulky thread by any means. So works really well. So 15 mil shank. Uh, the first step is we're going to put a tail on this. Um, again, I'm going to use a, a, well, not again, but a lot. I'm using a, a barred marabou from MFC. Uh, this is the bugger boo. So it's the smaller, there's, there's two. There's blood quill, which is the bigger plumes. This I'm going to just use the smaller because I do want to, um uh maintain the size and profile of this thing keep it toned down a little bit so i'm going to take um you know and russ will talk about this a lot with with marabou is um more is better uh you'll see a lot of his flies like flash monkeys and you know with it just an obscene amount of bucktail on his flies same with marabou his thing is you want to be able to fish it again and again and again and again. And marabou and natural materials will wear 
down they will thin out um if you have a down jacket that you've worn and washed for 10 years the thing's probably got not much loft left to it same as a streamer i mean you're ripping it through current um a lot of people know that your flies start not not looking so good after a while um so he'll use like generally on his tails and his marabou he'll he'll go double what i'm going to put here but again um i'm into a four inch fly so i'm going to take two of the plumes basically and i'm gonna just like i was talking about last time i'm gonna prep the tip by just popping the top off so again i just pinch the the feather and take the tip from the stem pop it off and that way when i align all the tips uh they're gonna come up nice and neat and even and these these plumes are basically like hand selected so they're all pretty great um you don't it's not like going through a, a one ounce bag or a giant bag of marabou and having um you know, half of them you got to cull through to get to the good stuff. Um, so anyway, I'm going to take these. I'm going to align the tips together. And if it is just looking too bulky for me, I will go back like I was talking about last time and prep the feather a little bit by taking, holding on and stripping out some of the base fluff. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take some of that off so just so i get like the right amount I, I i don't want it too too bulky or it's just going to clump and it's not going to breathe so that looks pretty good both feathers look pretty pretty even there okay so i'm going to align it and you can see these are this is the flat way so i'm going to tie them sometimes with a marabou plume you'll tie it sort of flat like that these plumes are very flat they're very they're very defined a lot of other marabou you could tie it in any way you want and it's going to be round um but this one i definitely want to create like a vertical taper so i want the the wide way down so i'm going to take these two plumes i'm going to line them up side by side okay align the tips and I don't want to go too long because I do want to keep this fly size down. So I'm going to go about, I would say, with my my ruler, I'm going a, a, about an inch, inch and a half, a tail there. Whatever suits you. If you want to create a slightly bigger fly with a little bit more of a, a flash on the tail or a little bit more, you know, pronounced tail, then go for it. Uh, so I'm going to kind of pull these down. And I, I do have two feathers again, so you could even take them and tie them one by one on the side but basically let's just get the tail on here so i'm going to take that i'm going to take about an inch and a half i'm going to set it over top okay and push my i'm going to pinch down over so that my fingers are now i can grip and feel the the side of the shank that i'm tying on and i'm going to hold it with that hand i'm going to take my other hand and i'm just going to give it just two turns to hold it where I want it okay again there's not not that much tail there and then I'm just going to switch hands and cinch that down so you know and and again if you're not happy with that if that's not long enough or you want it a little bit more then this is your chance and opportunity to to change it so that when you see that fly in the box you can be like yeah I'm going to fish that N not the one that's like yeah I kind of tied that not the way I want it. I'm never going to fish it. Okay. So again, you can do that. You can give it two loose turns or you can just, you can pinch it here and give it a couple wraps, take a look at it, make sure it's lined up. You know, I can see there that I'm very flat and vertical on the profile. Then I'll take these stems back and give a few thread wraps and cinch that down in front. And what that does is as I pull back, it locks the stuff in place. And and you just your your whole goal with doing this stuff is to reduce thread wraps, to reduce bulk. And that practice will make it very, very good for you when you're tying streamers and you get to the head of the fly and you actually have enough head left to do a whip finish or finish the thread without having everything unravel. Uh, so that just pulling it back and locking it in, you'll see me do that with all materials I'm tying off. I generally will do that just to lock it in and, and make it a little more secure. Okay, so I'm just going to cut the, the butts off, uh, give it a few more wraps down, and I'm going to add some flash here. So that is basically the marabou tail. 
most tales, um, I'm going to add some flash, usually a flash of boo or a mylar uh, lateral scale, something like that, just to give that tail movement some extra extra uh, um, visual. Uh, this stuff is kind of cool. Uh, the voodoo bard, um, micro bard voodoo fiber. It's uh, it's just a non non super holographic flashy flashaboo material. So I mean, if you don't have this, it is pretty cool. It's used a lot on steelhead flies. Again, just that double barring here. I have a barred marabou tail. I'm gonna throw a different barring. It's gonna really create some some suggested movement. It just kind of looks cool. Um, my favorite flashaboo for flash on tails or trout streamers in general is um, copper. Just straight copper flash um love this stuff it was sort of what birthed a lot of streamers was the flashaboo 6906 um it's just a, it's not even a holographic it's just awesome stuff for any kind of fly um so i would very easily put that on as well but we'll go with the voodoo fiber because it's a little bit of a newer material it's kind of neat and it does try and simulate a little bit more movement on the tail uh so i'll take about four or five strands and if you're using flashaboo and you wanted a lower flash fly then you can use two strands you can use one strand you could put six on and cut two off on the river or pull them off if you were you know finding that it was just too flashy in the water uh so i'm going to take these i'm going to take all of them in my hand i'm going to lash I'm going to bring them just to align them, but bring them just past the tips of the marabou. So I'm just about a, an eighth or quarter inch, just a little bit longer. I'm going to hold that on the side and I'm going to lash it in just with a couple wraps. Okay. So I got the, the one side is now set on my side. I've got all the loose ends out front. I'm going to take those loose ends. I'm going to fold it over and away from me and give it a couple more wraps. And now without having to tie in twice, I've basically taken the one piece, less waste, tied one side, wrapped it over, folded it back. And now I have the same amount of strands on both sides. And uh, that's basically the tail done there. Give it a couple more turns to secure it. And this is where you get into sort of building the body and the colors and um, the way, the, the tone of this. So, you know, in, again, thinking about the way Russ ties flies, uh, he's very suggestive. So his, his, his stuff is very, um, I wouldn't say it's, it's accurate in a very suggestive way. Um, so he's... Uh, matching river bottom colors he's doing a lot of toning in his flies but also putting in a lot of contrast so you're getting a real juxtaposition of colors but they all blend and match and it's just he does an amazing job at that and um, he's always leaving like hot spots and contrasting colors in rubber legs or you know um, taking the time to not just tie one color of uh, polar chenille when you're building a body up but tone it and do a couple because when you're swimming that it really starts to model and, and blend together like a natural thing. Uh, Chris, you're good. You can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start. I've got basically the the back here on this color. And again, I I you can tie this in any color that you're confident in. Uh, here's like white grizzly chartreuse, um, olive brown, and bright orange legs. And you can see just how that creates a nice toning. But you also have those standout hotspots that I think are trigger points for fish. Um, and, you know, sky's the limit on this. You can tie a fluorescent pink and chartreuse and, and you know, depending on the, the conditions. Uh, again, I'm going to Palmer up. You can use this as a polar reflector flash. Uh, very similar product to uh, polar chenille. So UV polar chenille should be in any streamer tires um, uh, repertoire uh, materials. It's the same stuff same length same type of braid but it is a little less uh translucent and has a little bit more mirrored flash like solid mirrored flash so you get this like it's just a little bit different but it ties the same and you could i could just as easily swap out uh, polar chenille i know that reflector flash is obviously available it it's not as predominant as polar chenille but it's 
basically the same stuff. Uh, so I've got a hot orange that I'm going to start on the tail. And I think I've talked about this before, but just like a natural material, this stuff is spun on like a loop and it is directional. So as the, the flash is spun on, it's going to be, you want to make sure that as you palmer forward, it's going to lay back and not lay this way. So similar when you're similarly when you're palmering feathers or whatever this stuff is directional so you will see that it comes off the braid pointing in one direction okay so i don't ever cut this stuff so i don't waste it uh unless i've got a really gnarled piece of the material i want it to be pretty you know uniform um so i will cut that off because that part's just totally mashed so with the tips pointing towards the back of the fly i'm going to tie this stuff on and just lash it in Okay, so tie it on and wrap it back to where your tail flash is. And then we're just going to palmer it forward. Okay, so I don't like to use a rotary function on this because I'm trying to preen these fibers out so, so it just doesn't get trapped and I can keep as much of it standing out as I can. So simple, wrap it forward. Um, and just uh, you want to leave a little bit of space at the head so you can finish that this section okay so um i'm wrapping forward here i'm just overlapping i'm not overcrowding so i'm just laying it down just like you would be palmering chenille um nice and even and uniform and i'm you know about seven turns six turns on that 15 mil shank and i'm coming right up just the last turn will be just at the eye of the hook. And then to tie this off so I don't trap a bunch of materials down, I'm, I'm always preening this stuff on every turn, every wrap. So I'm pulling that back just to get the materials out of the way. And then again, one turn, if you've seen that it's trapped a bunch of stuff, pull it out. Two turns, keep tension on the bobbin, pull it back and give it a couple in front and you're secure and cinch it down. So again, Lash it twice, pull it tight, pull the material back, lash in front, locks it in, pull it tight, trim off. And so that's that section. But the problem is that this stuff is like two inches long. So what I want to do is I'll take a bodkin or whatever, pick it all out, make sure nothing's trapped in there. And then I want the tail to be smaller i want it to build bulk or build profile as i go up so i'm going to actually just trim most of this off and not all of it but i want to have a, a narrower basically tail so i just pull the material up okay so i've just preened it all up so there's nothing no stragglers and i just kind of pull it back and cut it on a bit of an angle and then I take a look at it. And if it looks good, great. If there's some scragglers, you can just cut that off. And, and again, we're just building the taper. So this is just a nice, small, wiggly uh, tail shank. Uh, the last step here is I'm going to um, put start to tone or put a, a back on this thing. And that what that's going to do is create, as the fly swims, as the fish are below, they're going to see that hot orange flash as they come up on top or as the fly moves around you're going to see that tonality most bait fish most sculpins most anything the fish eat are going to have a lighter color belly than the back so you're trying to create that that tone which turn which takes the fly from completely suggestive to imitative um so this stuff here is is a relatively common material this is just a grizzly uh, marabou so it's really small um probably chicken yeah, marabou. Kind of like yeah. yeah. Um, and it's got a beautiful barring to it, and it's great for like covers. So where where you're joining to to uh, the back to the front of a hook, like an articulated fly, you can use this for your junction covers, uh, where you would tie it in just to cover that articulation and maintain that profile. So you don't have like one piece and like two hooks swimming together. Um, but it's also great. Like I would I would use this stuff on uh, like Kelly Silk Kitty. Um, where you're tying backs or stacks of marabou and then you tone it with some grizzly. Um, this stuff's great because it's cost effective. You get a lot, you get a lot of different sizes too. And you can generally work with most of the feathers in the bag. 
Um, so it's a great product. Uh, the golden brown, they're all in these really awesome natural tones. There's like a kind of like a ginger. Um, and anyway, sky's the limit. Use the colors. So I'll just take a bunch of these out of the bag and I'll start uh, I'll start using these as the wings for the back. So at the tail, again, I've got a whole bunch of different sizes here. So I always want to save the bigger, like the most perfect feathers for the front as I get more to the front. Here, I just want a little tuft. I just want to start to introduce that back color and the toning. So as I'm picking through, though, you're going to want to use it and to be a little quicker as you move up. You want to save those bigger feathers and kind of get an idea of where you're going to use them as you pick. I'm just over here picking through the pile, literally. Uh, so here's a tiny little feather, but that's perfect because I just want it to lay over the back. Um, so again, just like a marabou feather, uh, I'm going to strip the bottom third off just because that's just the basically the guard part of the feather and lay it over top okay and i just want it to kind of blend into the the start of the tail okay so i'm going to look at that measure it up then i'm going to take it just like i'm stacking a, a normal size marabou feather okay so i'm going to lay it over the top you're done flat i want to make sure say that again the, the flat on this one not vertical like the the tail right right so again this feather is flat so now I'm just putting it flat. So rather than be vertical on the tail, I'm now going flat to create a width instead of a height. Okay. And if I was going to venture a guess to say what this would be most suggestively imitating, it would probably be a sculpin. Or it could be a crayfish. It could be something like that that's a little more wider than vertical. Uh, so I'm going to lay that on top flat couple loose wraps i want to make sure because you know i'm now done this first piece i don't want to i want it to be perfect so a couple loose wraps look at it make sure it's sitting on top uh then you can cinch that down and again i'll pull it back two turds lock it in trim that off and then take a look at it i mean this is the time where you could trim some loose sections you know you want to keep this nice and small and tapered in the tail uh, but that's sitting on top. I'm happy with that. Okay, so just a couple more turns, and then you can whip finish. Um, and this glue, I usually will hit it with just a little bit of zap or, or whatever head cement. I'll put a dab on there and then give it a, a whip finish. Um, I don't know about you, Chris, but all of these brush brushable lids do they just fuse shut on you every single time you don't tie for more than a day? I, I've gotten lucky sometimes. I've I've issues sometimes with even just regular old uh, head cement jars <laughs> a lot yeah of that sometimes i don't know what it is i think it kind of oxidizes, like it vaporizes so as you open the bottle it starts to evaporate and i think it's just like i don't know i've had to take pipe wrenches to these things and i've thrown out so many bottles because i just i can't get them open but, but just such anyway stuff, you can't stop the, the recommendation <laughs> that i've determined on these is as you turn the lid to close it back don't crank it shut thinking that that's going to make it airtight. It doesn't. All it does is fuse it together so you never get it open again. So just tighten it till it's snug and you should be fine. I don't know if other people have this issue predominantly, but anyway, sure. don't remember ever used to. So I'll just put a drop of any kind of head cement you have on there. Uh, and then whip finish. Uh, some people can do half hitches or whip finish by hand. I'm not that guy um so with that glue on there again i can reduce the size of the head the bulk of the thread in the head and basically that's six wraps you could let you could do another whip finish again um but i'm not concerned that's going anywhere okay so that's the back that's part one of four cool. and um so i'll take that out of the vise the next uh part is a hook and i'm using a mustad on the back this is uh what i think would be considered to be like classic bonefish hook uh chris yeah, the big it's game. sort of a double. um yeah, yeah i mean it it could be um it's got kind of like a a little bit of a bigger than average gap and a shorter shank i haven't come across those in a while i think they do still make them but uh probably very similar i would say to like um 
Uh, like the A-Rex a minnow hooks, I think, would probably be pretty similar. Maybe not quite as long. Yeah. Like yeah, it's essentially, it's whatever hook. This is quite small. This is a size six, so you're, you're, you are quite small. But it is, um, this particular hook is a saltwater hook. Um, but uh, anything, it's basically, it's called an O'Shaughnessy kind of bend. So it's just got the right... I'm only using it because these things are deadly, deadly sharp. And because it's saltwater hook, they're very durable. And I actually love Mustad hooks. And you'll find that they're very similar to A-Rex, uh, made in the same country, we'll say. Um, <laughs> so these hooks are great, yeah. ultra durable, uh, double X heavy um, and a standard shank length. But, you know, match. So you've got a 15 mil shank on the back, whatever hook you like using, have using, I'm as long as it's a straight eye, um, you want to probably step this section up to a 20 mil. So take your trusty ruler, look at your 15 mil shank, and we just want to start to get a little progressively longer. Um, I don't, I actually don't see a lot of these either anymore. Yeah. I've got a bunch of them and I just, I use them a lot for back hooks. Um, because they're deadly. The, uh, the little uh, joke that you're making there, if uh, nobody caught it, is, I are, are you certain of it? I'm relatively certain of it. it must what's that? Produce the A-Rex hooks, right? Or what's that? Must that does produce A-Rex hooks. We're we're sure of yeah. that. Are we? Yeah. Are we announcing that? Yet? Oh yeah, they do. We've we've compared <laughs> like one of my favorite favorite hooks of all time is the Mustad Deer Hair Stinger. Yep. Um, and that hook, we, I was, you know, I've stockpiled those, uh, but now getting into a Rex, um, we've, we've matched like hook for hook, um, and size for size, basically the, the trout predator streamer long is almost an exact replica of the deer hair stinger. Yeah. That hook is ridiculous. It's strong. It's got the perfect shank length to create streamers. It's just ultimately probably the only streamer hook you're going to need is, is that uh, trout <laughs> predator long yeah. for trout stuff. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really liking A-Rex hooks, uh, using them more and more. I'm finding that they have a really good blend of, you know, hooks that are very suitable for back shanks where I want something a little shorter and the perfect combination and proportion for your lead hooks that are a little bit longer shank to accommodate your heads um and then yeah like right up right up into the musky stuff like the the big four to six aught uh pr320s the predator stingers those things are just dynamite because they're basically mustads and mustads are awesome <laughs> been making hooks a long time uh, another one that uh just came to mind as well uh the rx i think would work the other one that uh, folks could look into would be the um, the Gamagatsu SC15. I think. I mean, it's a little bit of a bigger gap, but I feel like probably in size four, not a six, because they're really short. Yeah, yeah, they're they are really short. Uh, that hook I use a lot for game changers for back hooks on like a musky game changer uh, because they're deadly and they're the right shank length on a musky size fly for backs. Um, but yeah, they're I would say they're probably like a one and a half length shank is compared to this, which is two, but just size up or down. Um, that eagle, that, uh, those SCs are, are great. Um, okay. So we've got a hook now and we want to attach the back tail shank. So I'm going to just tie on again and I'm going to go back. Um, you'll see me occasionally, like when I'm tying on or anything, when I'm wrapping, I'll, I'll sometimes just hold on to the head and pull tight just to make sure everything's secured down and not going to twist or spin. I'm going to go back just to the start of the bend and I'm going to take um, some wire. Um, you could use mono. Um, you could probably use like a 30 to 40 pound mono to join your, your shanks. The cool thing about this is there's no hook on the back, so you're not going to have to work a fish on this back piece. So you could probably use string if you wanted to, but I'm just going to use the normal wire that I that I would run on a any kind of articulation. Um, so like a bite wire or like any kind of the Rio um, stuff like that. Um, or like Senyo hairline has like Senyo uh, actual articulation or shank wire. It's all the same stuff. I use something in like a 0.46 mil is what I use for all like a 19 strand 0.46, which is basically Senyo stuff. Um, 
for all of my junctions unless I'm tying musky stuff and then I'll go up either to a, a heavy mono or the the next step which is a 0.62 um okay so the way I do this I talked about it a lot last time so I've got a piece of the wire I don't need it too long I'm not going to be concerned with folding it back on itself or anything to secure it because there's no hook in the back that's it, it just needs to be secured so this is like a nylon coated wire I'm going to take it I'm going to go back up to two thirds of the way up the shank. I'm going to leave a little tag end facing forward, even though it's not required on this one, um, just to kind of show where I would go if I was putting a hook on the back. So I've tied this in just slightly towards me. So that if you've got the top of the hook, I'm tying one piece of wire on this side of the top of the hook bend the other side on the other and that way it'll the line on the top and i'll be able to twist it and make it so that the loop is vertical which means the tail or any other section is going to ride together not twisted um so again i'm just towards me on the top of that shank and i'm wrapping back to the bend okay again give it a little bit of a tug and then I'm going to take my back piece and thread it through the eye of the shank. Okay, you could put a bead here. I don't want a bead because I want it to be very tight to the next section, um, just for proportion and um, profile. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just hold on to this and pull it. I don't want really anything more than a, like an eye gap of loop, so very tight. Okay, I'm going to pull it till it's close, and I'm going to pinch it. And I'm going to give it two super loose wraps, just a couple wraps, okay? And I'm going to take a look at it, and I'm going to pull it a little bit tighter, and I just want to make sure that that loop is vertical. So here's my opportunity. If it isn't, like I'm getting right up there and looking at it, I can take the loose tag end and twist it and bring it perfectly vertical. Okay, and once I'm happy that it's like that, I'm going to pull tight and then just wrap back to my start point. And there's your loop and this. And then I would wrap forward and I would pull tight and I would keep wrapping really tighter thread wraps. And I would go back and forth, back and forth um, to kind of cross wrap that and secure it in. And then if I did have a hook back here, I would then take both the tag ends, fold them back. So I would come like this. Fold that back, tie it back, take the other piece, fold it over. But with this, and you can glue it too. I mean, if you really are worried about it, you can glue it. I don't really glue this wire because it binds down so well. And don't use your good scissors to cut that wire, and I just cut the tags, tag ends off. Okay? So then you can give it a few more secure wraps as you come back to the back. And uh, now I want to create a... Uh, a junction like a cover so i want to start to make sure that i'm not leaving big gaps or it just looks like four flies in tandem um so to do that i'm going to take a hen saddle so this is um like a jumbo hen um you guys could use schleppen you could use uh mar like bugger woolly bugger marabou and create the junction i just uh, i'm using this just because it it also introduces some additional barring so some additional movement um Jumbo hen saddles, um, relatively well available. Um, here's like a beautiful ginger one. This is what um, Blaine's uh, feather game changers are tied on, are these jumbo hens. Um, they're not cheap, but you get a ton of feathers. Unless you're tying a feather game changer, which basically takes two chickens to tie it. Um, I would prefer to go synthetic where I can. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they're great. They're good for smaller, like when I'm into the smaller end of the fly, they're, it's it's a good option. But easily, schleppen, any kind of uh, small marabou feather, whatever. Um, so I'm going to take just off the patch. You're going to have smaller feathers essentially in the the butt section. And they're going to get bigger as you come out. So naturally at the back, I'm going to start smaller or into the midsection of this. And as I get forward doing my next sections, I will use bigger feathers just to give me a little bit more length. Um, so I'll take a feather out of kind of the middle. And just like prepping a marabou feather, uh, I do want to keep some of this marabou fluff on there just uh, to help create a bit of, a bit of bulk. I'm going to take that 
take some of the rough stuff off the bottom. Okay. So I'm left with a feather that's basically got two thirds normal feather, one third marabou type plumage. And you can tie this in any way. You could tie this in by um, doing like sort of the way Kelly does it is he ties a figure eight, like two cross wraps, just like you're lashing in some lead eyes or something and secures it with the butt section on the and then palmers forward so he's starting by turning the marabou i just from tying wet flies and stuff like that back in my earlier days i just prone to starting with the tip uh and then palmering forward i find it's in just a just my way of getting it to lay back so i'm going to take this to, to tie it in from the tip and these feathers do have a curve okay so when you're tying with feathers or palmering, you want to make sure that this curve is tied in so that as as you are palmering forward or collaring something, the the curve is going to so the the feathers sit back. So basically, I'm going to take this by the tip. I'm going to preen it back. OK, that preps the feather and I'm going to tie it in on the top with the curve down. And that's going to, as you now collar forward, that's going to give you um, an easy ability to have the feathers lay back. So I'm going to just sit that on the top at the point where I split the feather. And I will tie that in on the top and give it a couple loose turns, then tighten. Don't tighten it too much or you'll break that stem. And then uh, basically I will take a hackle plier and grab on to the butt section of that just to be able to handle it better and every turn i'm preening this back okay so i'm pulling the fibers back as i go um and i'm going to start palmering this so as i turn i'm holding those fibers back let's get my thread out of the way a little bit and keep turning there And this is just I'm gonna I'm gonna lash the thread back down over top of all this so that it it basically covers the the junction. So I'm almost wrapping right on top of myself every turn. I'm not actually palmering this too far forward. And I want to get some of that marabou in there. And then you can tie that off. So you, now that you're still holding onto it, you could lash that down. Um, the way just my way of doing it is I take it all, I pinch it and let go and then let go with the hackle pliers and give it two turns and then it's secure whatever is easiest to tie off okay and then i'll just make sure that this is all around uh, and again this is just a little bit of a darker color than the back that i i set and it's just creating some contrast and toning and, and if i'm talking too much and you want me to just tie you guys let me know and then i'm wrapping back to where I started the tie-in, and that's creating now a bit of a cover. So I'm starting to get a taper going, okay? Um, so after that, I'm gonna start here. So here I'm into this hook section. Um, so again, I'm, I'm gonna start toning with uh, two colors. And if you want, stick with one. I've got a root beer, so I'm gonna go root beer and orange, root beer and orange, and it will have a subtle impact, but it'll make you feel better about the fly too um, in the end. And that way you'll be more confident. You'll catch more fish. So that's the way to do it. I would say. I think the, um, anyway, it, I think it's, it's good to like uh, kind of touch on the, the barring and the variegation that you're getting on there. Like, you know, if you're trying to suggest life, there aren't a lot of, um, you know, inanimate kind of objects floating down river that have that barring and variegation, like, you know, sticks i mean they might have a little moss on them or something but they don't have that kind of unity and while well, still being broken up and having different parts to them like living yeah have that barring natural thing or like um you know you know what i'm saying like the um the yeah inorganic stuff usually doesn't for sure and i mean barring is, is natural uh but it also i believe you know in reading back in my earlier dry fly days like barring and and grizzly stuff like that it, it simulates movement too so like on an atoms or whatever where you're tying a, a dry fly or a parachute and you're tying with a grizzly saddle um 
that barring as you as you collar that dry fly hackle, it's creating movement almost. You know, I've read that you know it simulates that the legs are moving or something, and it, it, the way a fish views that. So why not treat it the same way on a streamer yeah. to try and make that fly do not only swim, not only color match, not only look like the right profile, but then do whatever you can to put some more oomph into the movement of it. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, it's almost, it looks like the light is coming in and out, in and out. And yeah, yeah, I guess it makes sense. That's For cool. sure. And uh, Fly Tire had a, a magazine article. It was one of the, you know, I, I tend just to skim those anymore, but uh, it had a really great, recent article i think last year about uh what what a trout sees and specifically i think it was a study done on brown trout i know this has been done all the time but it was nice just just to see it in a new magazine um where they kind of show underwater a color block of color color codes and they showed kind of which colors stand out and which colors really contrast and which colors just kind of look uniform and it's kind of the same with barring so you know if i i can't remember what colors really stood out but that's why i always try and have a hot spot um you know to put a very contrasting color just even as an accent like here i got fluorescent pink eyes just because i do believe that having that just gives that extra trigger point um but really interesting article and and uh kind of cool to see it's not only the brightness and the flash but it's actually the the color itself that can have the biggest impact on the contrast um because some days flash you're not going to see flash flash isn't going to do anything in the in the water and sometimes it's going from a white to a black a white and black combination or you know uh, an olive yellow that a fish sees that color contrast and change so kind of cool mm -hmm. um so again tying with the tips back i'm going to start with the root beer and i'm just going to do half and half so i tie in the root beer I come up to about the halfway point of that hook shank and I'm just going to palmer that forward. And I pull the fibers back so I don't trap them as I come forward. And keep some good tension on this stuff. You want to make sure it stays tight so it stays durable. And that's about four or five turns. Pull it back. And here I've switched hands on the, the bobbin there. Give it two turns over top. Pull it back, two turns, lock it in, trim it off. Okay, so there's the root beer, and then I'll just wrap back a couple turns over top. Then I'll take the orange and find the right end there and tie in the orange. And I'm not sure if you guys would really be able to see this contrast and i'm not really looking to create like an alarming contrast it's just blending the colors really um you'll feel better about it and why not take the extra 10 seconds to do it um it, it does actually would make the fly a little more natural too so anyway I'm, I'm into the orange now the hot orange and i'm going to just continue to write behind the eye Pulling those fibers back, not trapping them down. My last turn is going to be just as I approach the eye of the hook. Okay. And I'm going to tie that off. Just like that, I'm going to pull out anything that was uh, trapped down. So I did trap a few there. So I'll get those out. Okay, and then again, I will start leaving full length on the next sections here, but this is still pretty long, right? So I don't want to overpower the tail. So you can see it's, it's you know, still at that kind of two inch diameter and the back end of a sculpin is quite small and tapered. So again, I'm going to take that. I'm going to pull as much without trapping any of that marabou or uh, hen saddle. Just I'm going to preen up the material there and pinch it, hold it back. And I just want it to come back about where that collar of hen saddle was, like just as it enters into the back shank. 
and just give that a trim again. Okay. Trim it up a little bit. Make sure you got everything out of there that you don't want. And give it a couple turns. Okay, that looks good. So then all I'm going to do again is I'm going to set another back. So the pretty simple on this uh, this hook section. So I'm going to take a slightly bigger. And again, these feathers here, um, if you don't like it, if one's not enough, throw two on. Um, just like you would set like a, a mallard flank on a on a zoo cougar or something like that, um, or a heifer groomer, whatever. If if you don't like the one, then you set two on there, and you can do them independently of each other. Or with this very light marabou, you could easily uh, just stack them and tie them in together. So I'm going to take again. You got that short stuff on the bottom. Take that off because I don't need it. Um, and it's going to take a look at that. You know, some of these feathers are almost big enough that you could pop the pop the tip, pop the top off. Okay. You see some extra stuff trapped down. You can pull that out. And I'm going to lay this down. And again, I just want to create a section. I don't want it to go too far back, but probably halfway. The tips of this would align to be about halfway into the back of the last section. So I'm just creating bit of a staging but I want it to overlap a little bit okay so again you lay that down you get it where you want it flat on top two or three turns is going to secure that in behind take a look at it is it where you want it is it enough yeah I'd say for that back back section I want it to be pretty sparse so that's good enough for me so I'm going to give it a few more turns and just create the head um, any questions coming up, Chris? Or yeah, we did actually have one. I was just gonna wait until you kind of got through that section. But um, so Oscar was wondering, and we kind of talked a little bit about this last time. Which uh, sink rate sinking leaders would you suggest for fishing these large streamers in the Grand? Um, so I know you don't fish sinking leaders; you just go for the full line, um, which is probably the better way to go, um, just because you lose casting power and stuff with the sinking leaders. And also, I know a longer sink tip than what the upper if say you know you weren't looking to be a whole other line for streamer fish you want a poly leader or something to throw on there Fast yeah you can get yeah for sure it's the same thing i mean if you got if you're out on the water and you got one rod and it's a five weight don't be scared of streamer fishing uh if you got one line and it's a weight forward floating fly line don't be scared of streamer fishing um uh, the the most easiest way to turn that floating line that you're going to sink it it's going to get maybe a bit more abused than if you kept it as a dry fly line or a niffing line or whatever but hey if you got one rod make it work so um what i have done in the past and what i would still do now um is take that you would get away with a 10 foot uh, poly leader um very simple cost effective solution to turning a floating line into a, a fishable streamer line with a sink tip um you know you would get into the extra fast or extra super fast uh, you know you could get into right behind chris there you've got the opst uh tip systems that easily would integrate onto a floating line to get by um and they're gonna they're gonna do what an integrated or a all one piece sinking tip or or full sinking head fly line would do uh and then you're running the same leader so at the end you're using mono um and if you're finicky which i wouldn't be with streamers uh for trout uh i would be going with mono and not floral um so right off the bat you could be theoretically fishing a dry fly hatch and then you're like this is kind of boring and not working and i want to go fish some streamers so i take my leader off keep the leader i put a 10 foot sink tip on poly leader intermediate to fast whatever type of water you're fishing and i would probably have that poly leader with my mono leader rigged up on it already so on the river when it's almost dark when i'm you know whenever it's good for you to go streamer fishing um you take one liter off and you got the whole thing ready to go and tie in a fly. So uh, as far as mono goes, I would run a straight piece of uh, 12 pound. Um, usually maxima for me is what I would fish for a streamer line or a streamer streamer leader. So put a loop on it. You got probably 
three feet to start and i would chew that up to about two feet before i think about adding a section and again you're just going to do a blood knot and add or whatever your knot is and and add another section or piece of it if you wanted to get finicky and you wanted a bit of a butt section to help turn over a heavier streamer then you could go with like a, a 30 or 40 pound mono uh just for your butt section maybe about 18 inches and then you go two feet of tip it and you chew that up and then you have still the butt section that's there there's an advantage to that too because even the tips can get expensive fly lines are very expensive um and if you're running a straight piece of 10 pound mono with a loop tied on to the end of your fly line and you're hooking snags and you're hooking fish you're gonna bite you're gonna bite through that loop pretty quick um so i would recommend take the time to build about a, a 16 to 18 inch butt section of 40 pound because that's going to help keep the life of your loop uh together because you're going to abuse that stuff right everything that's underwater is probably going to get hung up is if you're getting snagged and you're pulling hooks straight that means you're fishing in the right spot for the most part um so expect that so yeah that's what i would do i mean same stuff you'd have in your steelhead uh, leader wallet yep cool that's awesome. And, you know, like, uh, I think we covered it in your last time, but if somebody was looking to build, you know, like your ideal streamer setup, in your mind at least, I think you said you like, what, like a 24 to 30 foot, you know, sinking head. Um, yeah, if, if you want to just touch on that quickly. Uh, yeah, seven weight rod. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of, everyone it's whatever you like to cast and fish i mean i could say you want a, a fast seven weight but a lot of streamer guys are fishing like a mid flex or like a, a i call it a, a more of a soulful rod right um because you are still fishing you're not just throwing a two by four like you need to have feel you need to you know you need to love the rod you're fishing and not always is that an ultra fast rod that's going to do it you might not be able to cast a super fast rod and you like fishing glass with streamers rust does that um so i would say on average a seven weight rod in whatever you're comfortable with as far as the flex or the feel and the advantage there is that you have one rod that's going to cover bass, that's going to cover all trout, that's going to cover some light pike type applications. And uh, if you go saltwater fishing, that seven weight is probably in your window for most saltwater, smaller saltwater game too. Uh, so it's a that that nine seven in anything is a pretty versatile rod and it'll handle a lot. And if you get the right feel, it will not feel like a two by four. Um, lines i fish a 30 foot sinking head uh on the grand i fish a 30 foot sinking head on the white in arkansas i pretty much am fishing a 30 foot sinking head it's not often that i'll go into a 15 foot tip uh anymore but by all means i probably should be fishing that more on the grand because we're not fishing deep water we're fishing on average two to three feet of water uh and you don't need it um but changing up your retrieve, you can get away with it. And um, so, like, you know, if you want to talk lines, my favorites would be um, like Gallops, Shovel Heads, or Streamer Max Long type things where you have 30 foot head and an intermediate running line. Um, you can get lines that are the 30 foot head and a floating running line, which is more conducive to waiting because that running line that you're stripping in all the time isn't under your feet and getting mashed up on rocks. Uh, and then, basically you're running your you always have a, a 200 yard spool of maximum in your pocket and that's all you need yeah um so yeah yeah awesome we so, sorry yeah. if you want to right. kind of keep going with that you can but uh we had one other question i could probably answer quickly if you had one choice of rod for all rounder jumping from dries to streamers what would it be you're saying a seven is a great rod to have but that's probably not what you want this question at least um five weight I'd say um, if you take the streamers out of the equation for me, it's a four locally. Um, but if, if you're going to throw streamers in the mix, I do five and probably worth noting too. You're saying like, you know, if you have a five weight, you can slap a poly on that and still make it work. The poly leaders, if people aren't familiar, actually do change grain weight depending on the density that you get. So if you get like the fast sink versus the super fast, the super fast isn't just quicker sinking. It's actually physically heavier too which isn't the way that fly lines usually work. So, 
back up limits depending on what line and rod you have uh, and casting ability. Uh, so you may want to tinker around with it, start light or work heavier instead of just going for it. That'd be mine. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it takes some time to get it dialed in just like anything, right? Like you could have, you could go through three dry fly lines on your nine foot five way before you find the one that works for you. You might not be able to cast what your buddy tells you is the right one at all. Um, yeah, nine foot five. I mean, I, Rob Heel fishes a nine foot four or five, and he will change to streamers on a four weight or a five weight. And and when you're guiding, generally a nine foot five weight would be my all arounder choice for the grand um, to do light streamer applications with a tip uh, or nymphing or dry fly fishing. Um, nine foot five all the way. If I wanted, the next step would be to get an all rounder more streamer rod for pike bass trout that kind of stuff then i would be going to a nine seven those would be my two to get me through basically everything until you get into swinging uh for steelhead or muskie yeah and even i would say that'll even cover you for salt water yeah um yeah hands down even two rods i had a seven's great i mean can't go wrong there for sure but yeah i think that um, um, if you guys have technical questions about like what will work for your rod or should work at least for your rod then uh, i mean we're pretty familiar with a lot of gear at the shop we can help you out with that say that again chris oh just a note for the guys uh, asking if uh, if you have specific questions to like your rod your line that sort of thing we can help you out at the shop as well if you want to give us a call yeah for sure um okay so now we're into the second last portion of this fly which is essentially we're just going to step up and do the same thing and that's what's kind of cool i'm not doing there's not a lot of difficult technique here and you're building it like kind of like you get into that game changer platform, so you're building a really swimmy bug, and the whole the whole key is just to have the right taper and have the right proportions. Um, so here, again, I'm throwing another shank in here. So I've gone shank hook. Now I'm into a 20 mil shank, so I'm stepping up the length, and I'm just going to do the exact same thing in here. So I have the shank. I'm going to tie that on, and then I'll get to the the overlapping spot where the loop comes back and i'll close that you close it before so you use a wire loop on this or um well just the closure on the actual shank itself okay no i'm just so, curious because every time i've used those shanks i've always just looped the the hook in using the shank as well but i guess you're gonna tie a wire loop to connect to the back two shanks okay interesting any reason yeah um is it just a spacing thing Sorry, I'm just looking at this. No, you're right. This is, <laughs> sometimes I, I I half and half. Sometimes I will still wire a shank. Okay. Um, and I didn't. I'm not doing it on this, but half the time I do because I don't like. Sometimes I find that it binds, mm. and it doesn't give the freedom of movement, and it's too tight. Like it's too close together. Yep. Um, but. You're right. You caught me. Um, just little, like last time, time I fun. forgot the biggest part of the whole fly, which was the, the keel weight. Uh, so here, I do have the shank now. So I've got the eye of the hook, and uh, I'm going to put that shank through. Okay. So that the that's what these are meant for, is just to do a wire, like the, the wire of the shank goes together. Like Chris has perfectly pointed out there. Thank you, sir. And then I'm going to tie that in, okay? And I will use, uh, if once I get back here, I can now use my hook holder to hold that out of the way so I don't stab myself. I'm going to now close that gap and tie this, tie this on, okay? So there's my connection. And now I'm just going to do the same thing. So I'm going to select a bigger, a bigger hand saddle feather. Okay. And I'm going to do the same where I pull out the crappy stuff. I'm going to leave some nice fluffy marabou and some, uh, the rest of the feather. Again, I'm going to take it by the tip. I'm going to preen that back. Tie it in on top with the curve down so that I can color the entire thing. Um, 
if we were if we ever or if we are ever tying in person again i can get a little more technical on how i try and ensure a little bit more durability out of that stem you're not going to see it here probably but what i'm doing when i preen that back when i tie it in i'm actually tying back over a few of the actual uh, feather fibers as well as the stem it protects the stem and it also kind of creates a bit of a, a, a barrier with this too i'm not too concerned on how i tie that in as long as i don't break it off um because i'm going to wrap back anyway so where you know if chris was doing a beautiful like, classic steelhead fly where he's palmering that that kind of thing becomes more important uh to protect the stem and and create a durable fly here i'm just i'm lashing back over it anyway um so it will not come apart Pomering marabou is the same thing where you want to just make sure you're doing whatever you can to protect those stems because they are definitely not durable. So again, I'm just wrapping this slightly forward. I can I can almost just overlap it on top of each other. I don't want to come too far up the shank because then I'll lose some of the length and I do want to use this beautiful jumbo hen to create a good junction. Okay, so you can see there how this is really easily like there's not many fibers that are sticking forward. And that's because when I tied it in from the tip, I had the curve down and that just naturally makes everything lay back nicely. Sometimes you'll get feathers that suck and they will drive you nuts and they just don't work because there's either a twist in the stem or whatever else. Okay, um, so again, you could now tie this off by holding it or just my normal thing that i do now is i've got the stem sticking out between my two fingers i pinched it and two turns and i'm i'm done there so that and wrapping in front um and then i'll just again make sure it's it's around the entire uh shank and then i will secure that back over itself so that that stem can do whatever it needs to do it's not going to come up out okay so I've created that next step. It's got a nice, starting to see a nice tonality of orange barring, um, you know, the root beer, the flash, it's kind of hidden underneath the accents and uh, the barred back. So again, I'm going to go with uh, root beer uh, color. Um, keeping in mind with UV polar chenille, uh, sky is the absolute limit on your color combinations you can make go with your confidence colors you like tie your if if you're an olive olive and white guy then i'd be doing like a pearl uh belly on this and i'd be doing olive back and if you don't have barred marabou or barred olive jumbo hen then then use uh marabou use schleppen um that you can create the same type of swim that i'm going for here and again i've said i will say and always say that two-thirds of streamer fishing is confidence in what you're doing um part of that confidence comes from fishing stuff that you feel good about right so i'm going to come up just like the last the last section the last hook i'll come to about the halfway point and then i'll wrap this forward pulling it back as i go and you want to be relatively generous with this because you are creating um bulk in the body and there's just zero weight to this right so um you can not keep wrapping it on top of itself but you do want to get a good amount of wraps in there so that when it is wet and it is swimming it it still maintains some some good shape so about five or six turns there uh, you saw me just pull that back preen it back give it a couple wraps behind pull it back in front trim that off there's your root beer and um here I'm going to trim this before I do the orange for a reason, because I'm going to add some rubber legs in the mid mid section of the shank. And then I'm going to do the orange in front. Um, that's just going to it puts it in the middle. Uh, again, this is a Russ inspired fly. So that's generally what he will do on the back sections of his flies is he, he will you will see him put. And again, I'm trimming uh, less and less of this off. So now I'm going a little bit longer of just about a an eighth of an inch short of the total length of that chenille. Okay, and if it still looks too long, you can give it a little bit of a trim. But again, I'm just starting to build a, a wider, bigger section here. Uh, but anyway, I think it gives a cool swim because you've got, uh, you're putting it in a different place. So it's just, it's there and it's creating, you really have a good visible hotspot. So um, 
these are just a, a rubber leg that's like a, a, a splatter pattern, like a chartreuse with red. Um, but uh, any rubber leg you see, you can use. They're generally all, I would say, a lot of them are the same. Silicone, durable, barred, uh, contrasting, great stuff to use. I like to do something that's completely against the trend of this fly here. So this is chartreuse and bright red, right? Um, and tying in rubber legs, no matter what fly I'm generally doing. So I've got the hook or the shank. I'm going to take them. You can maybe see down here. I'm just going to take them and fold them over the thread. Okay. They're just sitting on the thread. Even them up. So hold them with one hand and put them even. And then I'm going to start to wrap and turn. And I'm going to pull these rubber legs or just slide them down the thread. Okay. Onto the side of the shank. And I'm going to give it just one turn and they're on. Okay. So they're both of them. Both ends are on my side, though. I've just tied them on my side and let go. You give it a couple more turns, wrapping forward. And then the same as the flash, uh, the flash you put on the tail, I'm going to take the ends facing forward. I'm going to fold them over the top, give it another two wraps back. And don't pull too tight because you don't want to cut the rubber. You don't need to be too secure just yet. So now they're on both sides, hanging down, uh, totally uniform. And I don't want them too long, but I do want them to hang down. So I'm just going to measure... Um, you know, if I was going to say something, you'd be about a third of the way into the tail on that with these two. And that way they're going to stand out, stand away, and hopefully not foul too bad. If you go super long, they're just going to get wrapped in either the hook behind it or whatever. So I've got that. Okay. We'll pull that back, give it a couple more turns, just relatively tight turns to secure it. And then I'm going to come up to the front uh, with the orange. And tie that in, come up to the eye, and we'll wrap this to the front. It's funny, somebody just noticed, and, and I had actually just noticed, I think, for the first time. You're left-handed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. I am a lefty tire. Um, and it's interesting that um, being a left handed tire. So anyways, I've just again, as I approach the, the eye of the hook, I'm just going to tie that off, make sure everything's uh, out of the way. Um, some vices are not switchable and some vices aren't uh, left to right compatible and some of them are but they're a real pain i actually had a lesson in lily and andy's house uh where they were showing all the parts and um um they we had all the parts of the table and all, we all had to like put together a jaw and uh layton is their kind of their guru that basically in the underground runs the shop, but any and the and all of the production and everything. So we assembled jaws, and it was very interesting to watch how they go together and how they mirror to flip and everything else. But that's the cool thing about the Renzetti vices is that um, all of them are changeable left to right, I believe, even into the master. I haven't ever tied on the master, but I know travelers presentations all all of those jaws are and clousers they're they're interchangeable i believe that's interesting i actually <laughs> didn't realize that you could swap the jaw but yeah i guess that makes sense you just flip over the uh the knobs and yeah they're well you have to reverse it it's got a spring and a ball bearing and you've got the nylon band on on all of these so you pull all that apart and you basically um you have to reverse the spring that's inside and then the bolts and everything kind of flips over but yes they are they are interchangeable so kind of cool that's some it. vices are anyone looking at a renzetti you can just buy them left and right hand you don't need to do all that <laughs> yeah. yeah well you can you can actually have chris do that for you and make sure <laughs> that it's good to go out of the box yeah. right and i'll teach you chris if i ever see you in person um 
Anyway, I'm just going to give that a bit of a trim to, to line up with the root beer and then uh, bring it back around. Um, I've had vices that I've had to get custom built uh, back when I was on the vice search because they you cannot change them. And that gets really tough when you don't need that vice anymore. And how many of us are left handed tires, right? Um, anyway, so now I'm going to take uh, one of the larger um grizzly marabou's and i'm gonna now that i'm up near the front i'm actually gonna take two of these so i'm gonna i want to build a little bit more presence there on the back so i'm gonna take two of the feathers i could prep them both at the same time again i'm gonna take all the the short the short loose stuff and i'm just gonna strip that off until i've got just the bare stems there okay yeah Cool. So I prepped those two. Um, I'm going to lay them on top. I'm going to measure up so that I'm just coming into the two-third point of that last back. Okay. And I'm going to set that on there. Or, you know, these are really great feathers, so I'll have to maybe pinch those. If they're not sitting flat and you don't like the way they're sitting, then tie them in one at a time or, you know, do it again until you're happy. This is, you know, you've tied a lot of fly now, so you don't want to half-ass it once you get up to the front. So I've got a couple wraps there, and I'm just going to take a look, make sure that it is sitting up on the top. Cinch that down, pull it back, and wrap twice in front or a couple wraps in the front. And tie that off hit it with some glue and then whip finish and that's a neat effect you get uh, tying the legs in kind of that midpoint because i guess with the chenille there it almost it props it straight out right whereas if yeah it just had the cast yeah over for sure when you got it when you got it when you got the legs right at the front and you'll see like most streamers you that you see with rubber legs they're right in behind the head so they naturally have all the material keeping them out and then the head kind of separates them and, and helps to do that. Um, but I find, you know, especially when you've got a hook shank behind that, they can easily get wrapped in there. So the more you can do to help them stand out, the better. So sandwiching it in between two materials really helps them to stand out and setting them the way I've done. There's, you know, um, Kelly, when he sets his rubber legs, he'll hold hold them over the top and do a figure eight cross wrap. So they're actually lashed in on top of the shank. And that does really help them. They just kind of lay out the way I do it works for me. Um, I don't have a lot of issue. The main thing is trimming them to a length that's not going to be prone to fouling on you. Sure. Um, OK, so we'll take that out of the hook holder. And we're into the the um, the front hook. So the front hook here is a, another Arex. Um, it is the the basically the deer hair stinger or the the TP six hundred five. Actually, sorry, this one here is a bit shorter of a shank. So I'm using the the Trope Predator Light, which is. Um, the TP605. So it's not quite that long because I'm not, I, I didn't need a super long head because I'm just going to do a rabbit loop for the head. So I don't need a lot of shank space to do like a wool head or um, a deer head or any of that. And I don't have lead eyes. So I don't need a lot of space. Normally I would need at least a third, if not a little bit more than a third of the shank to do the head. So if I did that on a, on a shorter hook, there would be no body the proportion would just be off so uh, usually i'm using the the trout predator long uh, the trout predator streamer long because it gives me sort of a 3xl or similar to an aberdeen hook it's perfect shankling um this one i'm going shorter because i don't need that much to create that rabbit looped head sure so tp605 number uh, size one um again i got uh my Eyes. So here's where you kind of got a proportion of the fly and make sure you're leaving your space, you're sizing everything accordingly, and you're not crowding the head. So I normally would start, um, if I knew I was doing a deer hair head, I would leave a third of the shank and I wouldn't tie on it. I would just leave it empty so I know I can't go past that point or I'm not going to be able to get my head. 
in this case, it's not so much an issue. So I will I will start at the eye and and wrap back here. Um, and lots of different ways of securing eyes and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to go just past, just a little bit past the bend, almost to where the hook barb would be. Um, and then I'm going to come up and I'm going to set my eyes. So, you know, about two to three hook eyes back is where I'm going to set these, uh, these eyes. So this is um, just fluorescent bead chain in a medium um use gold uh whatever you, whatever you got in a medium i take uh and will cut off four so similar to like a senio artificial intelligence or like one of his steelhead flies you have four in there so that when you create the head they're not hidden they stand out um and you know senio's thing is he will cut one eye off and have it keel a little bit different um so yeah anyway four eyeballs here i basically will hold them over the top of the shank and i'm going to give it a couple figure eight wraps so i will set it on the top even though i'm going to spin them around to the bottom because i want to try and ensure that i'm going to be hook point down and you'll see that so a couple wraps there just loose couple wraps there and make sure that that looks like the right kind of spacing that i want i don't need it too far in front or too far back anyway and then i'll just give it a, another couple Okay, then I'm behind, flip that over, just twist it, and that helps to kind of lock it and tighten it in and keeps it straight, keeps it right where I want it. I do that with lead eyes too. So I'll tie them in on top, give it a couple cross, just look at it, make sure it's good, and then I'll spin it around. And then I'll come back and, um, you know, three turns there, three turns there, make sure that it's, uh, you know, I'm going cross wrap over, then I'm cross wrapping over. So I'm creating an X. Okay, you can set some glue on this if it's uh, spinning on you, um, but I'm using a lot of good tension on this. And then what I'll do to secure, so I've got those X wraps, and then I'm going to come in towards me, and I'm going to go the sort of cinching together those cross wraps. So I'm I'm coming over top of the eye, underneath, pulling back. And what that's doing is taking those X wraps, and it's tightening them together and binding it. Um, and I will just repeat that until I'm sure that that's not going to spin or go anywhere. And I'm really pulling. That's why I'm holding on to the shank of the hook here. Okay. And that's good. I mean, for safekeeping, you could throw a little bit of uh, glue on there and then, you know, wrap back over. Uh, okay, so then I'm going to take another piece of wire, and this is important because there's a hook back there potentially, and I want to make sure that it's not going to come out. So I'm going to measure off uh, with my wire about a, you know, usually about a three inch piece. I don't, I rarely will use bigger, like the bigger plastic beads that you see on a lot of streamers, like those big six mil beads, basically like a steelhead heart bead, which we don't like anyway, uh, seeing in the river. They don't come off these flies, but I tend to use just the normal, like a smaller glass uh, e-bead. Um, and so again, I'm going to leave a tag end because I'm going to fold this over. I'm just behind. I want to make sure that I don't crowd this head because I'm going to have a lot of stuff going on there. So I don't want to tie this wire into where I'm going to create the head. Okay, so I'm, I'm just about the halfway point and I'm going to tie it in on the top of the shank just towards me. And I'm going to come back to just the start of the bend and tie that off again. Uh, not very, not super um, tight wraps, but we'll fix all that up later. So then I have a, a bead. The bead goes on, the rest of the fly goes on. Okay, and then as I, I, there's a lot, you can do this any way you're comfortable with, as long as you get a nice straight alignment of the hooks. Okay, so now I'm gonna come through and I'm gonna put it back through the bead. Okay, and now I have the fly and I've got a big gap of a loop. Right, so I want to tighten this up to just about a bead width of open loop behind the bead. Okay, so I come in there till I'm just about, I don't know if you can see that, I'm about a bead width. And then I'll hold that and give it just two, 
three loose wraps and i just will then look over it if it, if the loop is vertical and everything's looking straight and everything's great i'll give it a, a just a tight pull okay and then i'll wrap back to the the start point where they're both there i'll take another look because this is the last chance to not have to redo this and looks good so then i'll bring i'll bring it up the top the top to that about halfway point i'm going to take one tag end fold it back wrap the thread back on top so now it's folded over itself and i'll do the same on the other side okay and then i'll take my knot good scissors and cut these are actually a ceramic braid scissor that i found at the dollar store but they're good for cutting wire usually um <laughs> and my Great daughter cut. can use them too <laughs> anyway so they're folded back there so i'm pretty good i'm gonna now really start cinching this down because there's a hook back there okay so i'm going back and forth and I can now secure this again in the hook holder so it's out of the way and back and forth pulling it tight you could hit it with glue and now I'm going to take the biggest best feather I can get off this and this this if if I'm not happy that this isn't isn't long enough to cover this junction then I'm going to go up to a schleppen it's it ain't gonna matter I'm going to take you know half of a schleppen feather and get some webbing in there and then get some marabou in there create the collar or you could easily just do um, a traditional technique where you could take two pieces or marabou plumes like i stripped the sides the last time and create a junction i just like the barring of this stuff okay so i'm going to take you could even take two feathers here and, and spin them in together if you were concerned about the bulk of the the fly if you wanted to make sure that you know it's gonna withstand a lot of abuse uh then then tie two in for sure tie three in uh russ would probably tie 10 in there and cram it all on but anyway i'm preparing that feather uh at the tip i'm tying it in and trapping some of the webbing down just to protect the stem and uh then pulling tight and I'm going to take my hackle pliers again, and we're going to collar or palmer, collar palmer this thing up. So it's a lot of repetition on this fly, but it's going to give you a real nice swim, and it's definitely going to be worth the amount of time to to do the shanks and to create the taper and everything else. The it's um, and it's a fun fly to tie because you're not it's not in really that intimidating all i've been doing is collaring and palmering and making sure my proportions are good um and the fun part about it is you know creating those color tones and color patterns on this that are going to be are going to look good to you and are going to work in the water you're fishing um it's nice to tie flies sometimes like that that it's the te the technique isn't intimidating and, and you can have fun with creating whatever you want out of it but you do have to pay attention to what you're doing and make sure that it has the right shape yeah okay We'd so that you know near an i'm, hour and I'm a half good with that if you can see that i'm i'm getting into just into the back of the last section so that's yep. going to cover it up ni nicely oh I'll, sorry all i was going to say is um we've been gone for you know hour and a half or so but if it weren't for all the talking <laughs> which is great <laughs> You know, you could probably knock this out in half hour, maybe 40 minutes, or take an hour and a half and take your time and have fun with it. But Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're into four shanks, and if you have all the materials out, I could probably do this, and it's probably a 20 to 22-minute fly, but it's a fly that I'm going to want to keep fishing, and it's a fly that isn't just like if I lose it, I'm not. it's going to be painful, right? So you can't i mean unless you're like a mike schmidt or like a machine like a rich strollis you're not if you're not a production tire you're not a production tire you're a tire that's tying flies that you're going to fish and if it takes you an hour it's going to be that much more worth it to you in the end right mm -hmm. it'll hurt a lot more on the first cast into the cedar tree or or on that log jam or whatever but you know you should have a blend you should have blend of of things to get better at tying but also those gems that you're really excited to fish uh but you're also going to need flies that you know are your workhorse flies that you're going to be comfortable losing or you know that you can always fall back on um like the last one we did the 
the pokeroo um that's probably like a 15 minute tie but it's an articulated streamer i mean you could tie a woolly bugger and catch fish and you could tie a dozen in an hour um or you could be fishing a fly that takes you an hour and there's a lot more pride involved and a lot more confidence probably but yeah that being said woolly buggers are a very good fly to (laughs) catch trout on too yeah um we do have two questions first one um can you tie trichos on that vice the clouser i don't tie on personally but uh, i believe yes should be down to like 24s or so you're good right on those can clouds? i sorry on the on this clouser like this actual vice i'm tying on can i tie what like like small stuff like really yeah, small this stuff. will do this will do like a basically a six odd shark hook up to a 28 yeah so anything Mid-shot. and that's pretty much all yeah. the rins all the rins vices right yeah now this is this is the saltwater job oh, um so it does have a little bit of a, a bulk in the tip of it but you would looking at this i could confidently say that even though i i would have trouble seeing it anymore and i hate saying that but i do a 20 to 22 on this yeah and i would also throw a a six six aught double heavy musky hook in that on the next fly and and it would take the same amount of time to load it in the jaw and it will you could bend that hook on that jaw renzetti's are amazing like so so good <laughs> you can put anything yeah. on and they're so easy and yeah. yeah and i mean i'm tying on the clouser because it's what i enjoy tying on um i also tie on uh the the traveler and this has uh the game changer jaw on it um but like matt Graevsky ties uh, he's you know ties his musky flies on this vice um you can tie a 28 or 30 midge or, or trico on this if you really wanted to i don't know why anyone would put themselves through that but i used to do it so i guess i get it uh but you can then turn around and tie a 12 inch musky fly on this so this is this is matt's vice um and many others in the saltwater game too um so uh the traveler is is and with a six by six base uh, you you're not going to move this thing like this has less wobble and more balance than any other vice base that i've ever tied on um they're just great besides so, maybe the streamer base uh, i guess <laughs> yeah yeah um so that was one so, question so yeah basically you know do anything you want with the vice it's amazing uh the other yeah. one was from chuck Says he's trying to get more use of his switch rod. I guess he's probably using that more for steelhead than anything. Um, he was curious on thoughts for using for streamers like this. I mean, you know, my thought on it, casting efficiency is like you know the the number one thing that would suffer a bit doing it. Like yeah. a, a longer rod like that, it's heavy. You know, two handed casts are not the quickest things to pull off compared to just a straight overhead cast. And you can overhead cast a switch rod but it's not as accurate because it's a longer rod. It's got more give, so shorter, stouter rods are more accurate. And then retrieving a fly, if you're trying to impart action with a, an 11, 11, 6 rod, it's heavy, it's clunky, and it's just, it's not the greatest tool, but you could use it if you wanted to, for like, use it for sure. But it's not going to be as tuned as a single hand, like, 9-foot rod. Your thoughts, Nick? Uh, about the same. Um, trout spay is kind of a big thing that has cropped up a lot in the western, like rocky tributary, or like the rivers out west. Um, bigger rivers where you want to cover a lot more water than you could strip in a bigger streamer without a boat. Yeah. Um, single hand spay or double hand spay trout spay stuff is uh, great, but I mean you're losing the. Eff- you're losing the impact of an articulated fly kind of because it's going to be hard to cast it's not going to be fun um and um a spay rod whether it be for trout spay or steelhead is still meant to be a swung fly it's not meant to be a stripped fly and that's why the the lines are set up that way it's to cover a lot of water and impart a swung action and using the materials to create movement more so than the articulation and the erratic stripping. Um, very efficient, very effective. Anyone that's, that uh, swings for steelhead knows that you can have amazing days doing it. Um, I would say the trout spay thing, then you're going to be swinging something a little less in size, probably not articulated, 
yeah. imitating the same stuff though, and maybe a little heavier than a spay fly, um, where you're you're in that top column, like your your fish are moving up, you know, where a conehead woolly bugger, easy to trout spay that, um, you know, some of the uh, some of the bait fish imitations, uh, like sparkle minnows, things like that. Um, deadly effective crayfish, deadly effective two to three inch patterns. Hell yeah, do it. Um, because that presentation is more conducive to a crayfish's movement. Like you are going to have that pulsing and stuff, but you can do that on the swing. You're also having something just kind of crawl along there and it's going to get picked up and you can kind of twitch and pull or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't fish, I wouldn't fish this on a space setup because I'm trying to impart movement into this, the articulation and the stripping and everything. It's just a whole different kind of ballgame. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I should have been more specific. I was talking more about stripping a, a fly of this sort of size. Yeah. If you want to swing a bugger or a zonker or something a little smaller side and just do a straight swing or like swing with maybe yeah. some strips involved, like sure. Yeah. It's great. And the other thing is that just like, if you're planning on spay casting it, spay casting isn't as powerful as overhead casting and so trying to lift even a four inch like what we would call like not a giant articulated fly is next to impossible even if you've got like a really heavy skagit line so like yeah. again more tuned to slightly smaller flies and more of a not static but less uh, active kind of retrieve there so again play around with it see what works for you and again it's it's got to be fun too right so if you love yeah. swinging then you're going to be really good at it, doing it for trout. <laughs> um, anyway, so I've done my uh, um, uh, my junction. I've done the root beer. I'm not trimming this now. I've gone halfway between where I'm going to start my head and the back, and I'm going to put another set of rubber legs. I'm going to put three on here. You could put two. Um, and I'm going to, again, this is set in the middle because I'm going to put some orange chenille on here in front. So it's actually not right behind the head here. It's actually a little bit in behind. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap that back a little bit. Again, I'm going to take it and fold it over the thread. Okay, I'm going to pull it down onto my side, keeping a little bit of tension on there, wrap it forward, pull it over and down. And then those are set. Good to go there. I'm going to trim them off about halfway into the back rubber legs and just so that they are predominant there rubber legs can be pretty heavy and a pain in the ass to 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 cast too so i mean you uh, on these other ones i've tied i've put two um three isn't going to hurt you but i mean if you're in tying this and planning on fishing it on a five weight i'd probably reduce the amount of rubber legs it's mainly there for me not so much for the swim but for the contrasting color um Okay, and then I'm going to take uh, my final. We're finally there. It's a two hour fly. Uh, um, I'm going to take the last bit of orange and I'm going to tie that in. And I'm going to stop my thread so that I make sure that I'm going to leave room for the last part, which is the head. Um, so I just want to make sure I don't twist around those rubber legs on my first turn there. So I just held them kind of in place and wrapping this forward. And again, I don't need any longer to trim this stuff to create the taper because this is the front of the fly. About four turns there. Two over top, two in behind. Trim that off, wrap that back. Um, this is the only material on this fly that isn't like super co uh, common. Um, this is a, uh, so I'm gonna put another color and you actually don't need to do this. Again, you can see the color I'm using here. This is a, a an RD brush. Lively legs brush, uh, really hot in salt water, but uh, also really great stream application. Um, get it in two, three inches, whatever. It's basically um, a soft, 
a soft synthetic. Um, I can't remember the exact brush that's just as I think it's a streamer brush it's called, but it's a very soft synthetic that's got tons of different color toning in it. But then they've got these very fine rubber legs that extend beyond. And this is just, again, you can see the contrast just in this material. But now I've got, even though it blends, I've got chartreuse kind of or fluorescent orange. I've got some chartreuse green in there. I mean, ain't no use, right? I've got fluorescent pink on this, but it does actually, when it's all put together, it it does really work. And when it's when it's wet, it, it's going to look pretty realistic in a suggestive kind of way. So I do this just to get those rubber legs in there and to create a bit of a bulk in the color to help push water. Um, the only tricky thing about this brush, and, and if you don't have this brush um you could easily do like a fox collar in a loop or something just something to create a bit of water push and to start to introduce that wider head um again this would be somewhat of more of a sculpin uh type of imitation so you do have that wide to taper it is a pretty uh, cool so material I, though we yeah. do have a bunch of colors at the shop for anyone who wants to try it it's, it's you do stuff. have this one chris yeah yeah we do yeah, it's a it's a fun one. It's it's the only thing about this brush is that it's really kind of simple to trap the rubber legs down. Mm, yeah. uh, so you just got to be a little bit vigilant when you're tying it. So I've got it in there. Um, I'm pulling it out side to side, making sure those rubber legs are kind of free. And don't worry if you trap some down. And we're only going to be given this again. You got this brush and you if you're using this brush for head applications you'll be able to tie a dozen of these things before you get through it because i'm only using it for an accenting piece okay so again i'm just going to tie it and make sure just like with my natural materials that my fibers are back and not trapping give it two turns there and you can see maybe see that my rubber legs are starting to come out which is great news and if you see anything trapped grab your bodkin and uh, just pick that out okay i'm going to throw one more turn in there so i've got a total of basically three three wraps i'll come in and i'm just sitting in behind the the bead chain now take your bad scissors trim that off and i fold the the tip of that um wire because it is a, a wire a stainless wire that is the centerpiece of that those brushes just fold it back on itself so it doesn't come loose and then pick that out and you will start to see that your rubber legs um chris can you you see that mm -hmm. you can see the oh, yeah. orange in there so we've got some good contrast you got a nice easy collar you know a little bit easier than setting deer hair and and not that deer hair is going to create a completely different swim i'm just going to trim back a few of the um synthetic fibers just to I, I want it to be kind of in proportion and i don't want it to block everything else that i've tied on there Okay. Um, the last step, I like to put the, uh, so I will tie that back a little bit. And I like to put the last uh, wing or back uh, after I've tied this collar, just because it, it, when you're looking at it from the top, then it's all nice and uniform in that color tone. Um, you could take another orange uh, two inch marabou plume here and put that on. So then that's going to give you that, or you could take a larger or, or a, a regular um, marabou and set that over the back. In this case, I will go with the latter decision. And I'm going to take two more of these because I got, I still have some really nice big ones left. I'm going to strip that off. As you're doing that, Nick, we've seen it done a couple of times. So I think folks will be pretty good on it. Um, we had another question. Um, I, I feel like this is probably not so much an either or, but at least my thought would be both. <laughs> but uh, 
Is an upstream or a downstream cast preferred when it comes to streamers? Um, <laughs> good question. Um, depends kind of on the type of fly you're fishing and what you're doing. I think in general, if I was going to be like, think about what I, what I normally do as my natural instinct is across and slightly down and stripping immediately. If you want to introduce some, some dead, uh, like kill that fly, I would, I would cast or maybe quarter up a little bit. It depends on the current, depends on what's between you and where you're targeting. Generally, you're going to have some slow current between, like right in front of you, and then you're going to have some fast current, and you're probably trying to target something on the slower pot or the slower seam or current on the far side. Rarely are you going to be casting right into the fast stuff and stripping back to you. Um, if you are trying to target the slower pocket that's on your side, then I would probably be approaching the fish from downstream. So I'm coming up and would be aiming and casting up into that slack. So I don't have the fast water pulling my line around. Um, similar, if you're trying to drop something in behind a big boulder, if you're casting down to it, you're not really going to be able to drop that fly into the zone. Whereas if you approach that boulder structure and the soft water behind it or in front of it, if you come from an upstream, you can kind of jig it and then drop it into the into that pocket or pillow. Um, in general, on an average current where I'm dealing with more of a uniform landscape of water, I'm sort of just up or just kind of across and um, not mending and stripping and, you know, coming right through the the unless you really want to try and get something to drop on that soft then maybe you could try and stick handle it in there a little bit better but generally the fish are going to see it if they see a tiny little dry fly at, in five feet of water um they're going to see a streamer when it hits the water they're going to know it's there um so you want to just impart you want to trigger that reaction from the first time it hits the water and let the fly that you design get where it's supposed to get and let the line do it too um okay so that just that back there um, I've got the collar, so I've got the rubber legs that are kind of coming out as gills. Uh, I've still got a little bit of room there. And on top, now I've got a really great tone. Um, so here I'm just going to do a dubbing loop of rabbit for the head. Um, so again, the last one I did, I wanted a darker head. So I used uh, rusty brown or rusty orange. Uh, here I'm going to use Magnum. I use Magnum when I'm spinning loops to get enough rabbit off in the clip. Um, this is like a peach, a barred peach. And basically to do that, so to make a loop, uh, Chris, I know that we every time I do this, we run really long, but <laughs> I will try and go through a dubbing loop quickly. Um, so it's called a dubbing loop, but you put anything you want in it, really. Um, I'm going to take the thread. I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to fold it over my finger. Okay. About three, four inches of loop. Okay. So about eight inches of thread. I'm going to wrap it over top of the thread. Okay. With my loop. And then I'm going to take a spinner of some kind, whatever you have, a hook or, or whatever that would be, um, and put it in the thread. So now I have the loop. And I will come back and maybe just wrap, cross my thread, wrap it over just to secure it in. Okay. So my loops there, I'm going to set that down. Uh, with Rabbit, it's really, really nice, easy stuff to spin if you can get a good clip and get it in there. But I'm going to hit it. You, you generally won't need wax. Uh, but if you do, I use like a low tack wax and just hit the thread loop with it. Okay. So just a couple on there. Uh, you're going to want to find, and all rabbits different too, right? So you're going to have a, a zonker of rabbit where you're going to have a strip that's like three inches of perfect length, like really long. And then you're going to have a piece because it's a different part of that rabbit's back that's going to be super short. So with this head, you want to make sure that you're picking one of the pieces or one of the sections of the rabbit zonker that's like a really good long um, section, okay? Because you want you want this to be a bigger head um so anyways I've, I've got a pretty decent piece here 
So the way I, I would take this is if I don't like that, that I will take sort of the, the tag end. What, you can wet your fingers a little bit, but I basically hold it like that and pinch it with my other fingers because <laughs> I want it to stand out because I want to put it all in a clip, right? So whatever means that you have to get this fur all aligned right to the, the um, hide in a clip, go for it. I got a clip. You could use a chip clip. You could use one of those like binder clips or whatever, just a clip. Um, I have a few different lengths. Uh, this is a Petagene one um, for making like your CDC feather loop things. And I'm just going to go and catch as much of this fur, rabbit fur as I can. Okay. So I've got it in the clip. I've got all of it that I need. And now I'm just going to come in and trim it off the hide okay you want to make sure you leave some of the butt sections exposed out of the clip so that you can get it into the loop and if it's not enough then do another loop it's not the end of the world you want to make sure that you're finishing this two hour long fly the right way uh, so if it's not enough tie it off and do another loop so i have my loop ready here um i'm gonna take the hair and because i have the wax i'm pretty comfortable that it's not going to go all over the place on me but i do want to keep it nice and even and i will have some ability to play with it so i'm going to stick it into the clip or into the loop i don't know if there's any way right to hold that to but sorry it's just because the flies kind of obstructing it i don't know if there's a way to kind of yeah. hold up to the side or something maybe yeah so you've just placed it in the okay. side loop so there's my rabbit okay so i took the clip inserted it into the loop while it was open and pulled tight and pulled the clip off and now i have the hair nice and aligned and and stacked okay and in doing that i actually need to get that okay so we're good so i want to make sure that the hair and if the hair falls out of the clip or out of the loop like that kind of did then you're going to have to just pull it out and redo it. Um, so you get that in there, and you can you can space you can spread it out a little bit so you're not as bulky, and that's going to help spin and bind the hair in. So you, you, just because you pulled it off the hide and stuck it in the loop, doesn't mean you can manipulate it slowly to get it lengthened out. So you have more uh, collar wraps, and um, you can uh, you'll get it to bind better and spin better. Um, so I didn't like that because I lost some of the hair when I turned it up. So we'll get rid of that and do another one. Um, so again, we've got my loop still. And I've got a little bit of wax left on there, so I'm good. So I'm going to take uh, another piece of the hide. Okay. I'm going to pinch it. I'm going to clip it, snip it, OK, I've got another zonker there. I'm going to get it inserted and make sure that it does not come out this time. So here is where I'm just putting it into the loop and unclipping and letting go. And now I have my rabbit once again. I'm going to manipulate it down by lengthening it out a little bit. OK, and you don't want to go too fast on this because you want to make sure you don't lose the loop again. All right, so I've got that there. That's that's about the length that I want. So I'm literally just going to start spinning. OK. And I lost that again. Nice recovery. Okay, so I've got my loop. I want to make sure that the other materials there aren't um, aren't trapping down. And okay, so. <laughs> What happened there was the the one hook came off the loop, so I lost it because I'm trying to show this. 
but I caught it and it's not game over yet. So I can still, I caught it with my, my dubbing or my hackle pliers. So I can still spin this uh, loop. It was almost done anyway. And you can still, you know, get your, get your loop tight. Okay. So I was, I'm in the hackle plier. I'm going to preen this back now. And I'm just in behind the uh, B chain eyes. So I'm going to start to wrap it in front or in behind the eyes. I'm going to give it two turns just until I'm right up against. And then I'm going to give it a figure eight, just the way that the same type of way that I tied the, the eyes on. So I'm going to come underneath and then over top and then underneath and over top. And I'm pulling the hair back all the time so that I'm trying to not trap stuff down. And now I'm basically, I've now covered top and bottom as I pass the eyes and I have a good good tight uh, loop there okay so now i'm just going to wrap a good amount of this basically i'll use the whole loop um, in front of the eyes and this looks kind of crazy but once it swims rabbit has a very beautiful movement and it's a great way to do a, a head on a fly like this because it does give it a little bit of weight but it um super durable great stuff and nothing new Okay, so I've basically used that clip. Is a, I like that size because that generally is going to give me an average head on a streamer. Um, okay, so I've trapped that down. Hackle pliers off. I'll just take the, the end of that and wrap back. Okay. I'll just take a look at it right now and pick it out um you know here's where if you don't like it you can cut it off you can start over but i'm fine with that okay so now we've got kind of another contrasting tone where we've gone not crazy but we've got this peach but overall you've got peach you've got you know lots of different colors but they all kind of come together in the end Okay. And at least with this rabbit loop, you're not having to spin deer hair, which is always fun to do on a live feed like this. <laughs> it doesn't work. That was pretty cool. I caught that loop in midair. Yeah, that was um, smooth. So that's the fly, Chris. Did someone have a name for it? Are we going to name this thing? You know what? I don't think it's going to come together tonight, but uh, okay. let's let's keep the contest open if anyone has names. Shoot them along. They take a day or two to think about, it and yeah, just. I'll tell. I'll tell you what. If someone messages into Drift and comes up with a good name that you guys like, I'll mail the fly out to you. How about there that? There you go. There's some incentive. Perfect. So again, just a little bit of glue there, and that's basically the unknown, unnamed fly. <laughs> There's a lot going on, but not a lot of. Um, crazy techniques and uh four inches and it doesn't look like much but in the water i can guarantee you that it will nah, that thing's gorgeous yeah tons going on oh yeah okay. it's all i mean all those materials are just so soft and they're just gonna yeah breathe yeah. really nice like, water i kind of started tying this with a with a lamprey in mind because i'm using materials right. that aren't going to stay bulked out and you can imagine like a chestnut lamprey or a natural lamprey in our in our systems do get eaten and this is uh, kind of where I was aiming. Something that would cover a sculpin, but also something very tapered. And with all of those articulations, that's to me kind of more of a lamprey. Um, you still got some tone, but it's all very neutral with a few hot spots. And uh, I'm going to push some water and it's going to really move. So, um, yeah, it really could be anything. The other reason I was thinking more of a lamprey and a swim bug is because... Um, the weight that I put on it is very minimal. So it's really on a sinking line. You're going to be able to swim that thing like crazy. Cool. Very so cool. that's, that's that. Awesome. Well, thanks again for taking the time. Since you okay. mentioned the incentive of getting a fly in your box, we've had two, maybe three names come through. I'm not sure if one is actually intended to be named. I can almost see it. We've got the groovy, sanitary napkin 
<laughs> and uh, one person just said, that's a two beer fly, but I actually don't mind that as a name. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a two beer fly. Let's, let's keep it open for a day or two and see what comes through. I'm, I'm curious. We'll, keep, we'll choose a winner. Keep it open, Chris. Um, you and I can go over what we like is the best name, and uh, I will I will mail one or two of them out to the to the lucky winner that was able to endure us talking for another two hours to tie one fly. I'm glad because you offered to just quickly bang this one out after we did the pokeroo last time. I gotta say, I'm yeah. kind of glad that we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm glad we cut it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Um, had a great time, and uh, hopefully we come up with some good names for this one. I hope to do it again soon. Absolutely, be glad fishing. to have you for sure. Cool. Well, um, hope everyone has a good night. Hope everyone enjoyed. We do have uh, more streams coming up. We've got this Saturday, Andrew Marr. Andrew Marr is a guide at Wollaston Lake uh, Lodge in northern Saskatchewan. He uh, was actually featured in IF4 nice. video uh, last year. Uh, and he's going to be tying some of his go-to pike flies with us. He's a uh, real treat to listen to, super knowledgeable guy as well, so that's going to be really good. We've got Winston coming back next week for some more steelhead action uh, next Thursday. And we've got um, Tyler Dunsmore, another local guide on the Grand doing some steelhead stuff in a couple weeks' time, so lots to keep uh, keep excited about. But, uh, yeah, Andrew, first thing is going to be, uh, it's 10 a.m. this coming Saturday, if folks want to tune in then. Till then, uh, if anyone needs materials and stuff, we've got all in shop, and uh, you can definitely hit us up for any kind of tying or fishing info. Till then, we'll see you next time. Awesome. Right. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks again. Have a good night. Okay, we'll see you.